It's uh, 530 now, so we're going to go ahead and get started with the public informational meeting. Um, we will, in a, in a second here, uh, have introductions of our from our staff, FSEC staff, and from the developers folks. Uh, we'll be doing a detailed pre presentation uh, about the siting process, um, and then hearing from C Cascade Renewable Transmission about the uh, the project itself. Um, and then hopefully we'll have some time for questions and answers. Uh, we're not. This is not a hearing. This is an informational meeting. So we're not taking comments on on the project. There is a way to submit those, and we'll, we'll we'll talk about that. But that's not the purpose here. Uh, um, so, like I said last night, you know, it's it's like it's like sending in your ballot the day after election day. You know, you can do it and say you did it, but it's not going to count for the process. So, we want, we want your voice to count for the process. And you'll see there are lots of places where there's going to be public comment here. This is not one. This is public information. Um, yeah, it's a fairly complicated. It's a, it's a complex project. We're only looking at uh, what you're only going to be hearing from the Energy Facility Site Evaluation Council in the state of Washington. Uh, but we are not the sole approvers of this project. The project runs down the middle of the. It's part, partly on the Oregon side and partly on the Washington side, and largely right down the middle of the river. So. Uh, um, uh, Oregon FSEC is involved. Uh, our counterparts in Oregon are involved in part of the approval process. We're involved in part of the appro approval process. We're doing our best to, to to coordinate with with them. We're also in coordinating with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, which has approval and, and other federal federal agencies, which have a, a, a role in the approval process for the parts of uh, because it's a navigation channel. Um, uh, yeah, but so we're going to be talking about our, our, our piece of that. Uh, and with that, um, I think, well, actually, I'll do introductions. So I'm Stuart Henderson, uh, and I'm the Clean Energy Manager, uh, Program Manager for uh, the Energy Facility Site Evaluation Council, which I'll go into more of the background of our of our organization and passing down the line here. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Maria Belkina. I'm sp Site Specialist and Contact Person for this project inside uh, FSEC. Uh, I'm Joan Owens. I am the lead of the admin team for FSEC. Um, in the back by the um, AV team, we have Andrea Grantham. And uh, by the staircase in the back is uh, Alex Shiley. Oh, I don't think your mic's on. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Start again. I am Susan Brown. I'm a project coordinator with PowerBridge. PowerBridge is the developer of the Cascade Renewable Transmission Project. I'm here tonight with my colleague, Ernie Briggs. Ernie is a project manager with PowerBridge with 40 years in the business of developing power transmission, HVDC transmission in particular. Also with us this evening is uh, John Ostrowski. John is a vice president of construction with PowerBridge. And Carol Laughlin. Carol is with Lakeridge Associates. She is our local contact and helping us with stakeholder outreach, boots on the ground, so to speak, here. John Molis with Gallatin Public Affairs. He's also helping us get the word out about the project. Our environmental and permitting engineering firm is HDR, and from HDR, we have Susie Cavanaugh and Ron Spelsey. That's our team. Those that are here tonight, anyway. Back to you. Great. Thank you. Uh, and before I begin my presentation, I want to acknowledge that we are meeting on uh, land physically that's in, in the traditional territories of the Cowlitz. Uh, the Confederated Tribes of the Silas Indians, the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, the Cayuse, the Umatilla, and the Walla Walla, and uh, the employees of the state of Washington here and in, in this room and also participating online because we have folks who are who are online. Um, uh, are, uh, are participating, uh, are guided by the Centennial Accord uh, and Chapter 43376 of the Revised Code of Washington, respecting and affirming tribal sovereignty and working with our tribal governments throughout the state in government to government partnership. Um, so then, so 
to give you some background. Uh, again, wel welcome and welcome you all. Thank you for participating this evening. And I'm going to be giving a presentation on the process of the uh, of, of site review by the Energy Facility Site Evaluation Council for those who are not familiar with our with our agency. A um, little bit of history and background on, on FSEC. Uh, FSEC was created in 1970 for the siting of, of thermal power plants. Uh, the intent was to create one stop permit, uh, a one stop permitting agency for large energy facilities. FSEC is comprised of state and local government members who review each application before voting to make a council recommendation to the governor. Uh, if the council recommends approval, then the package to the governor includes a draft site certification agreement or SCA, which defines all pre-construction, construction, operation, and actually decommissioning plans. Uh, if approved by the governor's office, the, the, the decision will preempt all other state or local regulations. Uh, FSEC is made up of members from several different state level agencies. Uh, the chairperson is appointed by the governor, and there are standing members from five other agencies uh, uh, appointed by those agencies to sit on the council. Uh, the current council is made up of Chairwoman Kathleen Drew, Eli Levitt from the Department of Ecology, Mike Livingston from the Department of Fish and Wildlife, Liz Osborne from the Department of Commerce, Lenny Young from the Department of Natural Resources, and Stacey Brewster from the Utilities and Transportation Commission. There are additional agencies that, that can elect to appoint a council member during the review of a new application. Uh, those agencies are the Department of Agriculture, Department of Transportation, Department of Health, and the Military Department. And local county can also local county can also appoint a council member for the review of a, a new application. And if a proposal is located at a port, the port can have a non-voting member. Um, there are multiple energy facilities that fall under FSEX jurisdiction. Um, some projects, such as thermal power plants that are greater than 350 megawatts, uh, nuclear generation for, and nuclear generation for the um, purpose of generating electricity, are required to be cited through FSEC, uh, while others can opt in, uh, such as wind, solar, green hydrogen storage, or clean energy manufacturing. So they can be go, go through a uh, approval process by a county or other local go government or come through FSEC. Uh, transmission lines greater than 115 kilovolts can also opt in, uh, although if they're greater than 500 kilovolts, they're required to work with work through FSEC. And there are also thresholds for pipelines and refineries that you can find in, in great detail on the uh, um, in the revised code of Washington. Um, so our facilities, uh, this this map uh, may not be able to see it too well, but we, you can look at it online and we can talk about it afterwards. But this is the map of the facilities that are certified or have applied for certification under uh, FSEX jurisdiction. Uh, marked in green, there are six operating facilities, which include two natural gas uh, plants, uh, one nuclear facility, one solar facility, and two wind facilities. Uh, in blue are indicated four additional facilities that are approved but are not yet constructed. There's a clear circle that identifies the one facility that's in the process of decommissioning. Uh, and FSEC is currently reviewing, reviewing six projects that are marked in yellow, uh, including the Cascade Renewable Transmission Line along the southern border there, uh, which is the pre-application proposal that brings us here this evening. Um, some of you may have been, been seen of, uh, the been involved in the approval process for normal facilities. Um, there's a special pre-application process that that, uh, that transmission lines have to go through, and then we go into the, the the normal process that you might be familiar with, and that we'll be talking about in a second. Uh, this is a flow chart that shows that pre-application process uh, that an applicant will go through before submitting their application to FSEC. Uh, there's green checks on this to indicate the steps that we've already com completed. So you you know there we we first had our initial consultation at the far left there. Uh, well, it must have been about a year ago. Um, uh, documents were prepared. The we had a, there was a filing date uh, in December where the pre-application was uh, request was was formally made. Uh, notification went out, and we're now in that that we should we're, we're we got to we're starting to put a check in that second to last box there by having this public hearing, uh, not a hearing, sorry, public meet public informational meeting. Hearings are later. Um, simultaneous this, there are negotiations underway uh, uh, with local governments regarding the the uh, um, designation of a of a corridor, a tra uh, um, transmission corridor, 
Um, once these three public meetings are, this is the second of, of three public meetings, the last one will be tomorrow. Once those are completed and once the negotiations are complete, then the, the developer is free to, fi to actually file their formal application for, for, uh, for site certification. Um, yeah. Once that happens, it's a much more involved process that 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 takes place, and I'm going to go through this in detail again. Uh, here's a flow chart that shows the general process an applicant will go through when they submit an application to FSEC, so the next step coming down the line. Uh, there are green arrows you'll see on the chart, which indicate specific milestones in the process where the council and staff actively seek public input. Uh, you can see there are multiple processes that happen concurrently at the same time when FSEC is reviewing an application. There's the land use hearing and adjudication process outlined on the far left, uh, the State Environmental Policy Act or SEPA process down the middle, and the third process on the right involves identifying and preparing applicable environmental permits. Uh, all these processes ultimately feed into the council's recommendations that go to the governor. Uh, where an adjudication is required following a land use consistency hearing, uh, an order is issued to commence proceedings and initiate intervention. Uh, at the, at, in, here, members of the public who wish to participate in the adjudication must identify themselves and their issues in writing. There are pre-hearing conferences through which parties are granted intervention status and issues are identified. Exhibits and testimony are provided and cross-examination cross is conducted, after which the council looks at all the information in the adjudication record and deliberates. Finally, the council develops an order establishing their findings of fact and conclusion of law from the information provided uh, throughout these proceedings. In the middle there, for every project proposed, there's a SEPA review that is also performed. Uh, when a determination of significance or a decision to prepare an environmental impact statement or EIS uh, is made, public comments are taken on first on the scope of the EIS. Uh, after public comment for scoping, the SEPA responsible official, which would be the manager, of, uh, the director of FSEC, uh, determines the scope of the EIS. And a draft EIS is prepared and issued with a minimum 30 day public comment period uh, after which the final EIS is prepared and released. There are some other projects that uh, uh, there would be a determination made of non significance or mitigatable non significance uh, that would not require an EIS, but that's not, but this is that that's not this project, so we don't need to go into that. Um, Following the conclusion of the of these separate avenues of application review, the council develops its recommendations to the governor, tying together the information brought forth uh, throughout the application review process. Um, FSEC is also the issue, issuing agency for any applicable environmental permits uh, that a facility may require, including water quality and air quality permits uh, as they may apply. Uh, the permits are identified in the final package with the council's recommendation to the governor. For the purpose of this proposal, FSEC is coordinating with other agencies of jurisdictions, such as the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and Oregon State Agencies, to ensure that all requirements would be met and, and appropriate permits issued by our uh, by our respective parties. Um, at the conclusion of the council's review of an application, a recommendation will be made to the governor to either approve or reject the application. Uh, this initiates a 60-day window within which the governor can either approve the application, reject it or send it back to the council for reconsideration. Uh, any application that's rejected by the governor is that's the final decision for that for that application. If an application is, is approved by the governor, then FSEC has oversight of the environmental compliance for the life of the facility through decommissioning. Uh, FSEC has standing contracts with applicable, applicable state agencies that assist in the monitoring and enforcement of conditions, either in the, in the site certification agreement, identified permits, or the EIS. Uh, FSEC's enforcement authority extends to the issuance of any penalties also at, at, as they may apply. And finally, uh, with, uh, as previously mentioned, FSEC oversees facilities under its jurisdiction through decommissioning. Um, so prior to the start of construction of, of approved projects, an initial site restoration plan is required. Uh, then at the end of the life of the facility, prior to the start of decommissioning, a detailed site restoration plan is required. Uh, these plans must be reviewed and, and approved by the council. Uh, the project must also provide financial assurance for, for the decommissioning in the event that the project is no longer able to complete the process. Uh, assuming the project decommissions while staff under uh, excuse me, while still under full control of the developer, uh, those con costs would be paid by the certificate holder directly. Um, so that wraps up my presentation for this evening.
Uh, before I end, I want to remind everyone how they can submit comments for this proposal. Uh, you can send written comments to comments at fsec.wa.gov. Uh, you can mail them in at the address that's shown up there, uh, or you can also uh, uh, submit them by phone. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, FSEC is not now in a current active comment period, but there are several such periods ahead. And when those take place, um, the comments can also be submitted to an online comment database that, that we that we have available that will be made available. Um, all comments received, regardless of the timing or method of delivery, will be saved with the project record and be available to the council and staff for review. Uh, and with that, I want to turn it, turn it over to our partners, not our partners, the, folk, the, uh, the, the developers who, who are who, uh, for, the, for the presentation about the project. You want to use this one? Oh, the clicker. Very good. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Stu and EPSAC for hosting the meeting. Uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce and discuss our proposed green energy transmission project. This is an innovative project. It's essential to helping the states of Oregon and Washington achieve their clean energy goals and to help make the challenge of, meet the challenges of the climate crisis. Before I begin my presentation, I'd also like to acknowledge that this area is within the ancestral homelands and territories of the indigenous peoples of the Columbia River. This acknowledgement is not intended to take the place of authentic relationships with tribal nations, but it serves as a first step in our commitment to honoring and respecting tribal interests and cultural resources in the proposed project area. There are five highlights about the Cascade Renewable Transmission Project to keep in mind as I share my presentation with you. First of all, it's a 100 mile marine transmission line. It's 81 miles under the bed of the Columbia River and 19 miles underground. It begins in the Dalles and ends in the Rivergate section of Portland. It comes out and bypasses the Bonneville Dam uh, in Stevenson and North Bonneville. It avoids negative impacts of overhead transmission lines, visual uh, wildfire fire habit, wildlife habitat, and the risk of wildfires. It will be built over a 36 month period and the in-river installation will occur, occur during the winter months to avoid disruption to fish, fisheries and uh, recreational activities. Marine transportation is commonly used around the world. Our company, PowerBridge, has built and currently operates two such projects in New York and New Jersey. And with that, I look forward to sharing our pro project with you. This is the situation. Oregon and Washington, to meet the challenges of the climate crisis, have passed bold clean energy laws for electric transmission, or electric utilities, rather. In the state of Washington, CETA was passed, the Clean Energy Transformation Act. It required This is still going? Okay, works for me. And in Oregon, there's House Bill 2021, which requires that 80% of the energy be carbon free by 2030, 90% by 2035, and 100% by 2040. Unfortunately, what's missing to make these initiatives successful is electric transmission to bring the generation from the source to the need. So the situation is this one of the major Utilities PGE in its IRP, which is an integrated resource plan that they're required to submit to the Public Utilities Commission. PGE acknowledges that it's 
impossible to meet the 2030 emissions target without upgrading and building new transmission lines. And there is certainly an urgent need. Right now, there is minimal to no available transmission capacity running east to west. There are stranded renewables east of the Cascades. There are, an, there's an abundance of solar projects, wind energy projects that are in the process of being built, would like to be built, but can't be built because they can't plug into the grid. They're, they're in what's known as the BPAQ waiting in line, and there's, no, there's just not available transmission to service them. There's an increasing energy demand due to growth in the technology sector, regulate new regulations to electrify the building sector and the trans transportation sector and a growing population demand is increasing significantly west side west of the cascades both up and down the i5 corridor and there's a significant challenge with overhead wires and towers they're easy to build but hard to permit they're they're unsightly to look at and no one wants to look at them and they're a risk to wildfires And I'm going to let my buddy here, Ernie, talk about the technology. Yeah, my name is Ernie Griggs. I've I've been with this business for a very long time in a variety of capacities. I started with a hydroelectric plant that was built in 1907. Um, the risk then, as far as the financial community was concerned, was overhead transmission, AC overhead transmission. It was too risky. It was unproven. I've been involved in uh, hydroelectric supply. I've been involved in new projects. I've been involved in HVDC since 1985. So I've seen a couple of things around here. And when we talk about HVDC technology for, for electric power transmission, it is very much a proven, proven technology. And practically speaking, if you're interested and you want to take a look, um, you can go out there and search on uh, HVDC interconnectors, and you will find that there's there's quite a few of them. Certainly, Europe is is far out ahead of us, um, and in a significant way, as far as the United Kingdom has been working on uh, going to to win for a very long time. And the same thing is true of Germany, uh, Belgium, uh, not so much France, but the the countries there are taking the the transition quite seriously. So when you talk about a proven solution, what does it look like? Physically, if you look at the picture on the right, you see three cables that are in a bundle that's basically about this big. The Each cable of the power cables is about six inches in diameter. And as a practical matter, when we come to install the cable, what we will do is we will feed it off either a supply ship or a supply barge and then we will bury it beneath the riverbed. Uh, when we're out on land, that's uh, handled with with a various type of trenching, and the cable is buried underground. So this is this is truly out of sight, out of mind. The maintenance requirements for these cables is virtually nil, and they're good for 40 years, maybe longer. We've got we've seen some that have been in the the ocean for 60 years, and if you look at the the picture on the left there. That's basically the diameter of one of our uh, cables, and it's a cell phone. It's actually uh, Susan's cell phone sitting beside it to sort of confirm how big it isn't. Uh. <laughs> All right, the route. What we do is we connect to the Big Eddy substation up in the Dalles, which just happens to be next to another HVDC system, the Pacific DC intertie and the Solilo converter. And we connect there uh, at 500 kV AC. We feed that into a converter station. The converter station converts it to TC, two cables. The third cable that you saw in the picture is for fiber optic transmission. We, our, our control systems for DC conversion requires that the two stations talk back to each other at high speed. That's just part of the control strategy technology. From there, we come down off the hill, we go underground, 
And we use a, a technology called HDD, horizontal directional drilling. And what we will do is set up and we will drill underneath the shoreline and pop up out in the riverbed. And that's where we will, um, once we've got the drill done and we've got the borehole the right size, we'll bring HDPE conduit back through. And when it comes time to lay the cable, we'll take the cable, we'll float it on the, the river, we'll bring it down into the conduit and pull it up on shore. At that point, there's a transition joint. That transition joint uh, takes the submarine cable design and connects it to the underground cable design. Then from there, that cable will be buried going down the river. In Stevenson, we pop out of the river, pick up uh, overland, and the the reasoning is not hard to understand. Trying to work it through the, the dam doesn't make any sense. Um, that's been there for a long time. Its safety and security is guaranteed by the FERC. Certainly doesn't need us uh, messing around with that. So we pick up um, the the roads in the area. We'll show you those a little more clearly. Down on Hamilton Island, we pop back into the river. Uh, same thing, HDD technology, both ends of that interface. We, go, we continue down the river. Um, and then at Hayden Island, we once again land, and from there, we work our way over into the Rivergate Industrial Complex. That's our second converter station, and there we convert to 230 kVAC, and the uh, cables for that go over to the Harborton substation, which is on the opposite side of the uh, Willamette River. So that's that's how, the, how we get from one to the other. So when we say we're an 1100 megawatt project, we deliver 100 and 1,100 megawatts at the Harborton substation. We've got two pictures here that that uh, look at how this works and probably the easiest way. Up at the Dalles, you've got the Big Eddy substation right there. You've got the uh, first converter station, 500 kV transmission takes you back into there, and then you come down uh, via underground. That work? This one? Thank you. So basically, you've got the AC substation here, which is part of the electric system, part of BPA system. It's on the eastern side of the Cascade range. And from there, mm -hmm. we connect to the converter station and convert it to DC, come down this underground cable system down through here. Here we use HDD to get out into the river, and then the green line that you see there, that's the DC cable. Here, down at Hayden Island, what we do is we're, we're coming down with the, the cable again, HDD into land, and from there, we pick up this route right here, which is existing right away, and we come down here, we HDD onto um, the Portland side. From there, we utilize uh, public streets. We've got a converter station right here, convert it from DC back to AC. And then from here, we bring it down through and get it over to Harborton substation. Next slide. What you see here is, well, I might as well do that pointer again. This is uh, Stevenson, where HDD takes us from in-river over to, to the land. Now, horizontal directional drill, that's where we actually drill underneath. Once we've, once we've got the borehole to size, then we'll pull the conduit back, and then we can use that conduit to land the submarine cable onto land where we create the transition joint that allows us to connect the underground design to the submarine design. We come down the road and then come down through here. We pick up State Route 14. This area right here, Washington DOT suggested that we not use that for their reasons, um, which we understood. So we, we chose to, to find an alternate path. Come down through here. Then we come out onto Hamilton Island, HDD again, and pick up the cable. What's the next slide look like?
All right. We got we got the right slide. Okay. Um, this is an in-service converter station on the Transbay cable system that goes into San Francisco. It's one of the early stage uh, VSC voltage source conversion, which is a, a later generation technology of HVDC conversion. And it's it's fairly simple. When I say that, you've got the converter building. That's where the, the solid state power electronics is. You've got a control building, which also has some valve cooling equipment. This is also valve cooling equipment. Uh, you've got some AC he here. You've got some AC equipment here. You've got one, two, three transformers. You've got some connections between the transformers and the conversion equipment, but it's only on five acres. And what if if you can get a perspective as to size, this five acres has 1,100 megawatts coming into it, and that 1,100 megawatts is the equivalent of an 1,100 megawatt generator. But it doesn't have coal, it doesn't have oil, it doesn't have oil tanks, it doesn't have uh, natural gas connecting to it. It is simply a an electric station as what we're used to, and and it's it's a lot simpler, but electrically it does the same thing. This is how we uh, install the cable into the river riverbed, and the cable will be loaded either onto a supply ship or a barge. The cable will come off the back end, as we showed in the, the early picture. It's The cable is in catenary. And then there's uh, something called a hydroplow. And that hydroplow has a stinger for which, um, on the front of the, the stinger, there are high-pressure water jets. And those high-pressure water jets cut a trench into the riverbed, turns the, the, um, the solids into emulsive, and then the cable is literally comes out the bottom of the stinger right on the bottom of the trench and then the the emulsified sediment literally comes out of emulsion and falls right back into the trench so when it's called a cable lay burial process it's a one-step process that allows us to install the cable at the same time and rebury it at the same time so that's and just a couple of data points trench is about 18 inches wide will be 10 to 15 feet below the, the riverbed. And that's that's a matter of, it depends on where we are in the river that determines that. And again, it'll, it'll be handled by something that's relatively simple from a marine spread situation. And we also have to coordinate with uh, transportation, shipping and so on and so forth to make sure that we coordinate what we do so we're not in conflict with that. That's. That's that part. You're welcome. What you're looking at is a somewhat simplified uh, version of our project schedule. And uh, while this begins in the current year 2024, it's important to keep in mind that we have actually been working on this project for going on five years. And uh, in particular, we've participated in the Northern Grid planning process since 2020. And we've been working on uh, all aspects of project development that have informed our permitting process and permitting applications. And we've done significant work with real estate development uh, planning for the route. We think that this is a manageable schedule. It's similar to what has uh, worked for us in our development of our earlier projects. And uh, with this schedule, we would be online for commercial operation in the middle of 2029. To sort of review some of the key features that we've talked about tonight, this is a clean energy project. It will help Oregon and Washington achieve their uh, significant clean energy goals. It will provide power to approximately 800,000 homes. It will provide clean green energy which is very affordable and it will also provide resiliency and stability to the electric grid in the pacific northwest it's low impact it's designed to avoid sensitive cultural and natural resources and it avoids habitats visual and wildfire impacts of similar to of overhead transmission it's a it's great for the economy. There's good jobs that come with this project. Over three to 400 
highly skilled union jobs and apprenticeship programs will be support needed to support the project at peak construction. And additionally, once the project is in operation, our converter stations would require anywhere from 20 to 24 uh, full time operators and uh, skilled technicians to operate the facility. And there is no public investment required to build this project. It's estimated to cost uh, $1.5 billion and it will be completely privately funded. We're not seeking tax breaks. And what we hope to bring to the community will hopefully uh, strengthen the local tax basis. Hmm. That should say protecting the Columbia River Gorge. I think nothing says how beautiful the Columbia River Gorge is than the view that we were greeted with when we came in tonight. It's hard not to fall in love with that and we respect it. It's a national treasure and we intend to keep it that way. Um, we recognize the need for extensive environmental reviews for this project and we will fully participate in those reviews and we will meet or exceed all federal, state and local environmental requirements. For as long as we've been engaging with uh, residents of Oregon and Washington about this project, one of the first things that always comes up is, have you spoken to the tribes? People say it to us all the time still, and we take that louder. Can you hear me? We take that comment uh, very much to heart, and we have spoken with uh, all of the tribes that are in the vicinity of the project. We've spoken to the Columbia River tri tribes and we've spoken to Critvik um, and other tribes in the area. Part of the permitting process will require what's called Section 106 under the National Historic Policy Act. And that is uh, will be conducted by the uh, lead federal agency likely to be the Army Corps of Engineers, and it's a government to government consultation. So we're not responsible for that. We can't uh, facilitate that, but we do intend to fully continue to engage with the tribes to be available to them, to answer their questions, to hear their concerns, and that's very important to us. And we realize that we won't be successful if we don't honor that. Another question that comes up pretty often when we talk about the project is EMFs. Will there be measurable adverse effects from EMFs to the fish or similar marine from our cable or have there been from similar marine transmission cables? And Ernie's really our expert on that, so I'm going to let him just address it for a minute for you. There's two types of, of electric fields. Uh, the, the straightforward electric field voltage is captured within the cable, the circular design. You've got the copper conductor in the center. You've got shielding, armoring, all of the stuff that goes with that, that, that builds the strength into the cable. That keeps the electric field in the conductor in, or in the, the cable itself. Electromagnetic fields are inductive, and yes, they, they uh, are a product of transmitting current as part of the conductor. And in that process, um, the natural occurring uh, EMF for the Columbia River is about 54 microtesla. Microtesla is the union of, unit of measurement. And in that, uh, we've been able, now with the sophistication that is out there for the ability to model and forecast what it's going to be, our uh, generation of EMF at the riverbed surface is about five microtesla. So we're talking 10% of what the naturally occurring is. We are not a significant contributor. Uh, we can't say that we don't do it at all, but by the same token, uh, we also have had our existing cables uh, over in the New York area uh, tested and, and studied as well. And the, the results of EMF studies are pretty consistent and that you know we're reasonably benign we're not perfect but we're reasonably benign and low impact so that's that's about this the story on emf thank you and as we said earlier this is low impact construction the use of the hydroplow uh, significantly minimizes disturbance to the riverbed 
to the fish, the the benthic environment, and disturbance of any uh, anything in the soil. We will work with uh, state required seasonal work windows, which are generally in the late fall, early winter. So our construction time frame for installing the cable in the river would probably be late November to February, depending on what our permit requirements are. And that may happen simultaneously on both ends of the river, or it may happen over the course of two years. Power Bridge has a strong environmental track rent record. Our two projects in New York and New Jersey have been in operation for a total of 28 years. We have no reported adverse environmental impacts, and that's our plan for the Cascade Renewable Transmission Project as well. We need a lot of permits. We need an army. We need several Army Corps permits. Um, we need a Clean Water Act certificates, a Section 404 and a Section 408 to be in con in close pro proximity to the federal channel. We need a NEPA review. NEPA is the National Environmental Policy Act, and as our lead agency, the Army Corps would likely take us through the paces there. And as I mentioned earlier, we would need a national uh, uh, section 106 consultation with the tribal nations. We're here tonight with FSAC uh, for our siting permit. The beginning of that project process uh, got underway in December when we submitted our pre-application to FSAC. We would hope to submit our full application in the second quarter of 2024. We're also going through a similar process with Oregon FSAC, we submitted what they call a NOI, a Notice of Intent, back in March of 2023, and they responded with what they call a project order that spelled out for us exactly what information they would require in our full permit. We're working on the exhibits to support that permit and hope to have that submitted in the second quarter of 2024 as well. In addition, we'll have um, multiple Permits and approvals required by affected municipalities, including Portland, the Dalles, and Stevenson. Um, we will need interconnection agreements with Bonneville Power Administration and PGE. And began in first quarter of 2023, and we're still ticking. I'm going to turn it over to Ernie to talk about similar projects. This table identifies some projects that are actually in service and in operation, many of which we work with on an international basis. Uh, there's there's a, a regular sharing of, of operational and technical information as this uh, technology starts to grow in its application and usage around the world. I'm going to start at the bottom of the table where you've got Cross Sound Cable connects Connecticut to Long Island, New York, built in 2003. It was one of the early stage voltage source uh, converters, followed uh, fairly closely by BassLink, which connects Tasmania to mainland Australia. Uh, Neptune is basically a sister project that's one of ours to BassLink, and we we share a lot of of information back and forth as to things that we see during operation and and maintenance and that sort of thing. Transbay Cable in San Francisco came in in 2010, and you can see that the as this table goes up, uh, you're starting to see larger and larger power transfer levels. That's not by accident. Uh, that's more by demand than anything else. Our Hudson project which uh, also connects New Jersey to Manhattan, um, that went commercial in 2013. And um, what you see in those projects that are listed above that are European projects. Uh, they, they are significant in terms of distance, in terms of voltage, in terms of the amount of power that's transferred. So um, this, when we say it's a proven technology, we we can say that and be sincere in saying that. So that's that's really the purpose behind this table. If you're curious and taking a look, 
We've mentioned our other projects, Neptune and Hudson, a couple of times. We are very proud of them. They are two underwater, underground transmission projects operating in the state of New York, connecting to New Jersey. Neptune, as Ernie said, was completed in 2007 at a cost of $650 million. It links the PJM network, which PJM is a transmission system operator covering about 17 states, yes. some pretty big um, in the in the Midwest. And it, it links PJM with the Long Island Power Authority. It's a 65 mile, 660 megawatt HVDC system. It travels 51 miles under the, the Raritan River and the Atlantic Ocean and 14 miles underground in the shoulder of the Wanta Parkway on Long Island. The Hudson project, and, and it has, for the life of the project, supplied over 20% of the power to Long Island. Our Hudson project was completed in 2013 at a cost of $850 million. It links PJM and the New York grid uh, at a Con Edison substation on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. It is seven miles total, four miles underground, I'm um, sorry, three miles underground and four miles underwater under the Hudson River. Just before I wrap things up, I, I do just wanna say that, uh, you know, it's, it's our commitment to be respectful in the processes that we're engaging in and in our engagement with you. We would like to be open and honest and respectful with all the local, state, federal, and tribal governments and residents. We like to go above and beyond. There's no shortcuts. We've been in this business for a long time, some of us longer than others. And one thing we've all learned is there's no shortcuts. It takes a lot of hard work and Doing it the right way the first time makes a lot more sense than to try and cut corners. We will meet or exceed all permitting and regulatory requirements to build and operate this project. And we will be responsive. We'll respond to your questions and, and inquiries as quickly as possible. If we don't immediately have an answer, we'll say so and we'll seek out the information. It's important to us to be members of the community where we build this project. We are asking a lot of you and we recognize that. We will partner with local residents and communities to support organizations and causes to advance the environmental, social, and economic interest of the region and the neighbors. We wanna be a good neighbor. So thank you for hearing, our, hearing us out. We look forward to answering your questions, your comments, no comments, right, just questions. I think I think I got this one. It's going to work. Great. So thank you for that presentation. Um, we are going to now. Uh, uh, I'm going to hear. We're going to ask one person who's on. Chris Clark, if you can unmute yourself, and I'll introduce you in a sec here. Um, sure, Steve. Ask can Chris you hear Clark me? With Oregon yeah. to to make a statement. He's on uh, joining us online. Then we're going to turn to the folks here. If you have any questions, um, it's, again, it's not when it's not a public hearing, so we're not. You know, it, it, we're not taking comment here officially, but uh, if you have questions from the, you know, from from either from our side and the regulatory side, or for the developer side, um, that would be great. Also, for folks, who, I'm I'm looking at the list of people on my computer who are online. Uh, if anyone who's online uh, would like to uh, ask a question, just put up, put use the raise raise your hand function. Um, so for uh, again, uh, even before we met with met with folks here the, the, from the developers, we were already knew this project was coming, and we we were coordinating with the folks in in Oregon and our counterpart agency, the uh, the Oregon Energy Facility Site uh, Facility Site Council. Um, and uh, you know, the, the, there are uh, this, as I said at the beginning, this is a very complex project. There are parts of it that are on land in Washington, that are, and that part of the project is fully going to be under review by Washington. There's parts that are on land at the beginning and the end that are fully on land in Oregon, and Oregon is going to have sole authority of those. And then there's all the stuff in the river, you know. And it, like you say, originally we were going to we we were, we were going to have the Washington people study the the Washington fish and the Oregon folks study the Oregon fish, but we just couldn't figure out which were the you know we couldn't keep track of the Oregon and Washington fish, and figured why don't we get together and do one study 
uh, of, that we all agree is the right study to, to do. So the Fish and Wildlife people from both sides have been meeting um, uh, to come up with it, you know, what that study ought to be so we can do it right. And um, uh, yeah, so Chris, um, would, would, would you be willing to say 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 a couple things here? And uh, we're really glad that you're able to join us. Absolutely. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, well, yeah, my name is Chris Clark. I am a senior citing analyst with the Oregon Department of Energy. Um, my colleague, Sarah Esserson, is also on the line tonight listening in. Um, we will be assisting, uh, as you mentioned, the Oregon Energy Facility Siting Council with the state level permitting review uh, for this project on the Oregon side of the river. Um, as uh, Susan mentioned, we completed our pre-application review process last spring and we'll begin the application review uh, once we receive the application later this year. Um, that review will include additional public information meetings on the Oregon side, um, as well as additional opportunities for public review and comment. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the Oregon process or get on our mailing list, um, you can find information on our website at oregon.gov slash energy, or feel free to contact me at christopher.clark at energy.oregon.gov, or ask Stu for my contact information. Um, he should have that as well. Um, I'll also be on the line for the rest of the Q&A session and happy to answer any questions that come up. Um, otherwise, I'd just like to thank Stu and the rest of the Washington AFSEC team for um, your great efforts in making sure that both states have a coordinated and comprehensive review of this project. Thanks so much. Thanks, Chris, and thanks so much for taking the time to be here. You were last night and here tonight. Um, really appreciate it. So again, I'm not seeing any hands online, but go ahead and put up your put up your hands if you want. If you have any questions that you want to ask, and uh, just turn to the folks here in the room. Here, does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask either uh, folks here from FSEC or Oregon F Oregon FSEC or with from the developers? Yes. And, and and for the way the process works, if you could say your name, if it needs to be spelled, spell it, and then go ahead. Sure. Uh, my name is Peter. I'm with uh, Congresswoman Perez's office. Uh, I'm just wondering what kind of impacts can be expected on State Route 14 during the construction process. I'm John Ostrowski. I'm with the Cascade team. So when we work on the state highways, we work in a coordinated fashion with uh, state regulations and any other contractor work that's going on. Um, we try to stay off the roadway as much as possible, off to the side, um, shoulders if need be. Uh, we control traffic and we work the hours that are required uh, by the permits uh, to take care of things like noise. Um, most common things is noise and, and traffic and such. So we work within the permits and we and we lay it all out before we even think about going out there. Oh, great. A, a question in chat. Can you, can you read it? Can you read it? Oh, okay. Got it. Um, well, great. I'll go. Uh, Simone, can you want to can you um, unmute yourself and and ask your question? Sure. Thank you very much. My name is Simone Auger, and I have a question um, in terms of the lifespan of the cable. You had mentioned um, you expect about a forty year lifespan, and in terms of usability, my my question is twofold. First of all. What happens at the end of life for that, um, the cable and components, and who's responsible for that? How long will this um, be maintained by the developer? Can you give me the parameters on that, please? Well, I, I can go ahead and answer the first part of that for for the, the Energy Facility Site Evaluation Council. Because uh, so part of our, our whole review process um, and our, our regulatory authority continues all the way to decommissioning. So you know, removing removing whatever's left when when the when the time when the the project is no longer um, uh, uh, viable or is no longer useful, and and re restoring the 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 
uh, the pl places where the where the project was fully to their to their uh, uh, pre pre project conditions. Um, so they're, they're, for, in order for the project to get approved, it has to have the preliminary plans for how it's going to do that. Uh, and then later on, it has to have final plans before it begins that what we call the decommissioning process. And the costs of all that, that whole process are, are, are uh, to be paid by the by the developer. Um, so, and I don't know if you, do you, you want to also hear specific things from the developer about um, how, ex how long they expect this to last? Is that part of your question as well? That would be helpful, yes. Thanks. And and just how long they'll be maintaining. And I understand what you just said. That's helpful, but I'd like to hear from them as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yes, a, a typical lifespan for one of our submarine slash underground cables is something in the order of 40 years. There are cables out there that have lasted 60 years and continued in service at full performance as they as they did in the beginning. So that's kind of the lifespan that we're looking at, and we are working with our, our uh, the agencies and our permit application as to how we're going to define with decommissioning and what it's going to look like in the future. And and um, I'm not sure I've got a lot to add to that, but it, it's basically an iterative process where uh, there's a fair amount of back and forth. Uh, we rely on our consultants also to help us understand what we're what we need to do as far as being able to forecast what decommissioning costs would look like. And of course, as technology changes, the, the actual uh, decommissioning plan could change in the future as well. We, we can't predict that today, but it could happen. Great. Yeah, and that's, I appreciate the question. That's actually one of the things we're, I could say, proud about in, in terms of FSEC regulatory authority that, uh, you know, somebody can't just come and do something and walk away from it. There's, uh, there's uh, um, uh, legal obligations and financial obligations uh, um, to, to make sure that that doesn't happen and that, and that as I said, the, facility, the, the, the environment is restored to the conditions it was prior to the, prior to the project. Are there other questions here in the room? And you, you're not limited to one question, Peter, if you want it, if you've got more. <laughs> All right. Anyone else online have any questions? Going once, going twice. All right, then uh, with that, as I said, a good meeting starts on time and ends ends about half hour early, and that's about where we are. So folks in the room can can stick around and and if you have other questions in, in a more informal manner, we can we can answer questions. And um, with that, I, I want to thank everyone for for being here. and we really want to thank the the rest of the FSEC team, both here in person, particularly those here in person, uh, but also folks who are online. I want to thank folks from uh, the Cascade Renewable team. Um, thank particularly all the folks uh, from the public who came here tonight and who were also joined us joined us online. I think it's nice to end something like this with a round of applause or appreciation for the folks for other folks. And uh, with that, we'll declare this public this uh, this public information being to be complete. Thank you very much. Thank you.